Hi, I'm Debbie Millman of Design Matters, and you are listening to U.S. Modernist Radio. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Oh, I don't care what mama don't allow, gonna draw my modern anyhow. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Welcome to U.S. Modernist Radio, where we talk and laugh with people who enjoy, own, create, dream about, preserve, love, and hate modernist architecture, the most exciting and controversial buildings in the world. I'm Tom Guild. Architecture is a tough field, one of the most demanding in terms of academic work. Once you graduate, a master's degree in something else is usually what you need. Then entry-level pay is seldom great, and everyone, we mean everyone, is a critic. Back in the 20th century, when modernism had its heyday, the small number of black architects had it even harder, yet they quietly created homes and buildings across America. With few exceptions, like Paul Williams, these projects rarely got any fame or press. White people don't think of mid-century modern as being in black neighborhoods or created by black architects, but there's actually quite a lot. Today's guest, Gerald Cooper, created the wildly popular Hood Century Instagram account, seeking out black design modernist architecture. And now here's one of his fans, Mr. Modernism, George Smart. Hey, thanks, Tom. The work of talented 20th century black architects has been under the radar for way too long, but that's changing. Twelve years ago, the only person I knew about for modernist houses was Paul Williams in California. Then I learned locally about several houses in Greensboro, North Carolina, by architects associated with North Carolina A&T University, which had what they called an architectural engineering program at the time. This led to a research project to document everyone before 1970, and from there opened up dozens of discoveries of modernist houses. You can see that documentation at ncmodernist.org slash ncblack, plus additional profiles on the men and women in Greensboro from NC A&T. If you know of people we don't have documented, please be in touch at george at usmodernist.org. U.S. Modernist Radio is underwritten by Diane Bald and the Budman family, restoring significant architecture in Toronto, Los Angeles, Malibu, and Palm Springs. Born and raised in Cincinnati, Ohio, Gerald Coop Cooper made his mark in the music industry as a manager for artists such as Young Guru and the British R&B star Emma Lou. In 2019, Coop started the Instagram account Hood Century, pictures of mid-century modern buildings hidden in plain sight. He has since expanded to encompass historic preservation, both mid-century architecture and black architects. Coop collects and develops educational resources and lifestyle products aimed at affecting cultural change. He's also the founder of the creative studio Things We've Made, and he's had profiles in many publications such as L, Vogue, City Beat, and Dwell. Welcome to U.S. Modernist, Coop. Oh, man, so happy to be here. This is so fun. So, Coop, I got to just start with, I just love the Instagram account. I mean, you are finding great stuff out there. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. You know, it's, it's been quite the discovery, and it's really been able to open up my world, you know? Seeing this architecture in my neighborhood or, or sort of finally being able to define and see my neighborhood has just been so fascinating. You're just finding buildings that I'm sure have not been publicized before. I'm, I'm seeing one recently. It's the Fred Hampton Pool. Where is that? No. Oh. Yeah, I was hoping you mentioned that. That's in Maywood, Illinois, which is a suburb of Chicago. And has an interesting story because of um, Fred Hampton's, you know, when he was over, young, young 21-year-old who unfortunately was assassinated by the FBI, actually, Black Panther member. His whole thing when he was 17, 17 years old, all the way to 21 years old to his death was getting Black folks to swim. Uh-huh. You know, at this time, segregation was a, wasn't was allowing us just to simply have the act of swimming. And so at the point of death, this building was uh, erected and, um, you know, the roof lining, just seeing like Fred Hampton Aqua Center, it, you know, it just, it's just like, it's, it's jarring uh, from a design almost. And then obviously this relic that was left behind in order to, to create positivity and, and a place to go, a refuge 
um, still exists to this day and not many people know it. It's in Maywood, Illinois, which is a suburb of Chicago. So it's essentially in Chicago. Is that where he was from originally or do you know? That's where he was originally from. His yep. hometown. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, you're from Cincinnati, and I understand there's a particular bridge in Cincinnati that got you interested in architectural history. <laughs> yeah, so I'm one of those kids that growing up wanted to be in New York, and I, I noticed that the more I found out about where I was from, you know, in those in these like random conversations, the more I really started to appreciate where I'm from. And so Cincinnati is actually, it's a northern city, but it's at the south. We call it at the South. And um, this bridge that, we, that you're talking about is the John Roebling Bridge, which um, was actually built with some funds from New York City, partly to test out these new suspension bridges that got really popular in the 1800s. Uh, a lot of the Germans were coming in and building them. And New York City was like really wanting this new bridge to connect Manhattan and Brooklyn. So he built in the mid 1800s. He started to build a replica of this of this Brooklyn Bridge in in Cincinnati, uh, connecting Cincinnati and Northern Kentucky. So to see if it was going to work, yeah, to see if it from an engineering point, not only could it work, but could it support a high traffic area? Because at this time, the South and the North Corridor was a very obviously high traffic area, and in fact. Um, this project, you know, when it was being built, this uh, Brooklyn Bridge, we call it replica or whatnot, a prototype, it, it actually stopped being built like two or three times because of the Civil War. Wow. Yeah, because of the Civil War. Right because right was the Mason-Dixon line running along a southern end of... There you go. Yeah. There you go. Hmm. So, so basically, the Mason-Dixon line separates Cincinnati and our downtown, if you've ever been there, from Kentucky or essentially northern Kentucky. Um, and the line is uh, essentially the Ohio River. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So not a lot of people know that when you go into these small towns that there could be, uh, I was just saying Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and I got to lay my eyes on the, you know, just the Quaker Oats headquarters, you know. These these are all things that we grow up with. And, and one of my things, Tom and George, is utilizing pop culture to teach. Sure. Right. So it's so it's like if you you know the Brooklyn Bridge. So for me to tell you more about this replica, it was really easy. You know, it's like the entrance was easy, and that's what I really love about like the cultural connection to architecture, y'all. It's like, and a lot of people, a lot of dope people do it within the modernism that we've seen this whole time, connecting it to movies and stuff. And I really think that that has been a great tool that I've been able to use with this account thus far. Did you ever see that video from about 10 years ago, Coop, with Ice Cube talking about the Eames? Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I, I thought that was just the most fabulous thing. And then I didn't see a single other thing about Ice Cube and modernism after that. Yeah, I mean, it really, you know, what's really crazy is that the media is just not there yet. So, like, even with my account, uh, if you look online, this is one of the first, not only connections, but conversations from a native voice, because I, I really utilize language a lot, y'all, um, because language is a massive, massive thing around talking about design, talking about space. And so you see, like, the, the re I think the reason that it's fascinating for Ice Cube to be there is partly because, you know, he's an African-American male from hip hop, from, you know, the roots of a gang banging hip hop. And one would think with that reality, one would never think modernism. So I love that language. And that's part of what I'm working on creating with Hood Century, where right now, if you look at the documentaries that are online, not only about the black folks, y'all, but like, you know, imagine like Frank Lloyd Wright, his falling waterhouse with like a Snoop Dogg voiceover, you know, a documentary, <laughs> you know? <laughs> she gets Snoop on the phone. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Exactly, but that, but that speaks to a whole different audience and therefore right. opens it up. You've got some great pictures of people in these houses. I mean, mm -hmm. great pictures of people on these Instagram posts as well. There are two women here with wonderful hairstyles sitting in front of a Gary building. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Those friends of yours? Yeah, nah, nah. So I'm really into, I'm really into research, you know, and cultural research, I'm calling it, and those photos of those two young ladies came from a photographer named Bill Gaston out of Baltimore. And oftentimes when I'm looking for photos um, to post, y'all, 
I'm trying to see if there are any photos of us in front, black folks in front of modernism. Now, you know, as y'all know, everybody loves using architecture as backdrops. Right. <laughs> like we, right. And, and I know that black folks do it as well. And so Bill Gaston, um, the great photographer out of the, out of Baltimore area, he documents the neighborhood. He took those pictures, but, and, and behind the original picture y'all was the Baltimore aquarium, this, this postmodern building that I actually went to as a kid. So, and I love the picture. So I posted it, but as I posted it, I thought, yo, those curls and they're called, they call them barrel curls. Uh-huh. And those curls, Remind me of something. And I just sat with it, sat with it. And then it clicked that, you know, those barrel curls sort of reminded me of that Walt Disney Center that Frank Gehry designed and built. Yeah. And so then I ended up just taking the picture and putting it in front of those barrel, those designs of Frank. And everybody loves it. Essentially, I'm about to release some prints and some product around that image because it's just, it's really touching people. What's that thing they do in art museums? They do it in the North Carolina Art Museum, where they will take a recent photograph or image, something that's, you know, from this century, and juxtapose it next to something, a classic Mm -hmm. from uh, 300 years ago. It's like Mm an intentional compare and contrast kind of thing. Yeah. And that's, that's really cool. This is an account online that does that with like music albums like uh-huh. pop culture music images, they juxtapose it at the actual location that this that those photos were taken. Yeah. And I really think it, I think it, I don't know if anybody said this, but I think it humanizes the world, right? Because sometimes the world seems too vast and it's like, oh my God, where is that album shot? I have no idea amongst all of these millions of places that it could be. And so I think a lot of preservation projects that use are in actual space, like popular culture and space is really, it really humanizes it for us and makes it, makes these spaces real, I, I would say. You do a lot of things besides post on Instagram, Coop. I mean, tell us about your scouting for music videos. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I do way more things that I can give titles to. <laughs> but uh, I'm actually sitting right now um, in a buddy of mine's house that's in Sherman Oaks. It's a, it's a modern app from the fifties. And just before the pandemic, he remodeled the, his crib to almost be like a, like half of the crib is actually his master bedroom. Almost it feels, even though he has like two guest bathrooms. And so I was in here one day and I, I would get like these emails and texts about locations because you know, during my work with his century, I've just been like uncovering locations sort of, you know, like not on purpose almost just kind of, this kind of as a process of it. And so people have started to reach out to me to do some location sets, not only for music videos, but last Super Bowl, um, the LeBron James team reached out to me to help think about the architectural history and the architectural consistency of his childhood apartment, which would just happen to be a post-war um, modernist international, you know. Style. Yeah, style in, uh, in Akron. Ohio. And so I went into that. That was one of my favorite. That was in February of, of, of this year. And it was really gnarly because I had seen the Spring Hill apartment building that LeBron had grew up in and for the last maybe even decade and always had an affinity of, of going to shoot it or work with it or travel there. Because I think of it, you know, I, I'm from Ohio, y'all. I'm from Cincinnati. You know that. Right. So yeah. LeBron James and how he has become who he, he has become uh, is very near and dear to me as an Ohioan. And so it's almost like this public housing has become a mecca because he he named his production company Spring Hill after, you know, this housing project. Like how significant it was that to him. And which again, modernist, y'all, and black modernism, I don't think we think we thought about these projects as being symbolic, <laughs> you know, to some folks. A lot of people talk about how dark and unfortunate these projects were. And I and I always mention that, but fellas, I wanted to also mention that these places are now the names of a lot of these people's studios and Jay-Z yells out his public right. housing, you know. These were all homes. These were all actual homes with yeah. actual memories. And for a kid, most of those memories were good, right? So mm-hmm. um, I, I think my my approach, or I know that my approach to this is not just like tearing it down. Even though I talk about 
you know, the misfortunes of the housing authority. I think that, I don't know if this would be true. And I since consider myself a layman around the knowledge that I've attained in modernism because it's, it's been so un- informal, but I almost look at the history of the housing authority to be way darker than the history of the, the, the architects that had these utopic thoughts of those housing. Cause oftentimes oh, yeah. we, we are damaged. We're like going at them like, Oh, you know, what a pity. But I'm like, now that I started to look at the housing authority here in the United States and the things that they've done that haven't been good, the co- the cost cutting and the fact that most of these buildings are still up today. <laughs> well, some um, of the things that we've discovered, Coop, in talking with different guests about public housing is that, you know, right from the get go, there were regulations in place to keep public housing projects from being true communities. For instance, it would be prohibited to have a grocery store on the project or a church or a school or industry on the property. Why? It was seen to compete with the mostly white industries and businesses and so forth in the area. They didn't want to create something right there on the campus. And so as a result, you get basically a warehousing of people and not a creation of community. In a desert. Yeah. Yeah. And then the housing authorities are not given any money by the federal government to run the things once they're built. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That was a huge problem. So part of the work now is, so I I started the account at the bottom of 2019. And when I came and started the account and kind of got vocal and started to do initial interviews, y'all, I saw things as so easy, right? Like, why can't we turn this button? Can't, why can't we see the, the, the housing projects and some of the, the beauty in them and why can't we go and nominate Marcy projects for Jay? Um, yeah. And over the last three years I've noticed, and I've actually stepped into the industry and, and understood the complexities of doing the simple things. And it's really even invigorated me more y'all to be able to create a, uh, um, a pseudo and a, and a quite a small younger um, preservation entity that allows you know, mostly black and brown folks, but, but folks who really care about these things nationwide and locally specifically to understand how to preserve. Because that's obviously a thing that not a lot of people understand is those, base, those, those basic things around preservation. Is what you're referring to the Streets Preservation Society? Correct. You're correct. Correct. So what, what I'm hoping to do is launch Hood Century Streets Preservation Society as a collective, right? So there's three kids in Memphis sign up and three kids in Cincinnati. And we just share tools and we share language that will help, that will start to help these things from a, from a very, very, very micro level. Um, fellas, one of my favorite jokes that I talk about is the Texas Center for Historic Preservation in a lot of cities that I'm starting to see pop up or have been there, right? Like these Texas Centers that get some work done or whatever. When I speak about them in the in the black community, they sound like myths. Huh. <laughs> they like people hear them as myths, like, oh, I hear that there's a you know, it's like this big story about that there actually is or isn't. Or if you do this in your house, can you not now sell it or do or make any modification? There's a lot of misinformation. Oh yeah. And and that is a part of what I hope Hood Century could be is just a soundboard of information. Well, this is a legacy, I guess, from the redlining that was done by banks and others. Yeah, that's true. That mistrust, yeah. Yeah, to prevent black families from profiting off their properties. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there's a lot of mistrust, in it, and you can't, I don't think we, I know that there's a certain amount of people that don't have the mistrust. So even for like white preservationists to work with it, I know it's been difficult. And I've actually heard because there's a lot of mistrust in the black community of who we're working with and how, you know, and what the intentions are. And so there's just a lot going on there. And there's also just, um, as we speak, there's a lot of movement. So in North America, you know, black families and brown families are moving or being moved out of the city, right, as we speak. Why is that happening? Who's, who's making that happen? To me, it's a cyclical market. It's a market effect, right? where now in Cincinnati, I'll use for an example, the downtown basin area that encompasses the United States' biggest historic district, Covington, Kentucky, downtown OTR Cincinnati, and um, the West End. These massive, crazy amounts of Italianette duplex buildings, 
turn into the slum during the time when the city was expanding, y'all. So, you know, this is the early part of the city. So it's like, yeah, we're going to be here. We're going to be here. Then, okay, the Jewish can be here. Okay, then the African-American can be here. It, it's going to be the slum during the Jewish and African-American time. And then now the African-Americans move to the suburbs. Remember that? Yeah, you know? right. And here come the white folks back from suburbia headed to the, the, the inner cities now. To do their it's gentrification. Just, just, yeah. To do that thing. And then here go the, you know, the black folks back into the super suburbs or the suburbs. And there goes the disinvestment because you know how it goes. And so that's happening again right now in North American cities. And one of my thing, George and Tom, if I could talk about the cousin of preservation is archiving. One of the interesting things about like knowing that you're from somewhere, a physical place, is being able to see it. I'll say it again. So one of the like most comfortable and sort of the things that a lot of like families do is like, you know, we, we have our photo albums and we show you like, hey, this is when we built a house or this is when we moved in the house or this is when the neighborhood was this. And what happened with the digital divide over the last 20 to 30 years amongst African-Americans and black folks, the displacement as well as the living conditions, black folks don't have their archives with them. And so what's happening, what's gonna happen, and I'm gonna talk about this more over the next year, is the public institutions, the libraries, the schools, the museums, they now are the holders and the safeguarders of the African-American or the Brown archive. That's photos from school. That's that's like all of these connections to where you were and where you grew up. And what I just said to y'all is that now that black and brown person is actually leaving that county. They're leaving that city, but their archive isn't. Right. And it's so important to get that material digitized in some way so that everybody and because there's a lot of knowing in that. One of my um one of my favorite photographers of the modern time, um, and I might say his last name right wrong, Julian Shulman. Yeah, that's Julian right. Yeah. And so he's one of my favorite, you know, photographers. And mostly because, you know, you can really similarly say, like, this was the time. Like, he shot a period, you know? He was able to show a period of time. And what I fear because of our constant displacement and constant, like, non-record keeping culture, we call the African-American culture or the African culture oral tradition, um, right. Which in the digital times just is just not working out so great because there's either like a lot of talking or no pictures or videos, and I fear I fear that if we don't like understand our space and what's happening in our movement from the infrastructure bill to you know certain just like we have to be a little bit more hyper aware than our white counterparts and what's happening in these neighborhoods. I feel you know it's similar to what happens within the architectural community as a whole. I mean, architects, black and white, tend not to be good record keepers. And their stuff ends up in a garage. And then 20 years later, it gets thrown out, largely. Mm -hmm. And we, we lose all that information, the photos, the slides, the VHS tapes, the Super 8 reels, I mean, all those different media. Oral histories that sometimes people make on cassette tapes that they forget about, that mm -hmm. they've made. I mean, all of that has to be recovered. Yeah, exactly. exactly. And all of that needs a, a, a modernist, you know, dot com, right? All of that needs, like, people who, like, y'all probably more than often volunteer or do it for the love and even for the, you know, the future. I think that's what we need over on this. I, I was talking to a, a preservationist in Cincinnati. I'm not going to say her name, but she said something that was really um it was really heavy to me, but it also, I agree with it. And she says there's a lot of cultures that needed during this last 100 years, 200 years, needed to pre preserve their things, right? And their culture. And a lot of them are doing it. And this, and this white young, she's an older woman, but she's a um, developer in Cincinnati. And she said, Gerald, why do we need to preserve y'all stuff and our stuff? So, and huh. But I got, I got it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm one of the people who actually agrees with that, right? Because I don't think that y'all, I don't think that other people, even though y'all have been preserving for a longer time, right? So it would be great to like have some pointers or whatever. But we need to African Americans, queer folks, black folks, young folks. Like we can't always depend on people who have done it before, or who have gone in front of us. Because if that's the case, this black modernist stuff is kind of weird. Because like this stuff is. 
I mean, these guys were around during the same time and we were depending on certain people to document them that that may not happen. What do y'all think about that? Well, you know, the older I get, Coop, the more I can see the blatant discrimination that took place as I was growing up, which I didn't see at the time. Mm. And it's it's evidenced by whenever a, a person of color did something with a house that was really remarkable, like Wilt Chamberlain's house, which you featured on Instagram. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, both he and and the architect who designed it were kind of ridiculed for the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Like it was this stupid kind of house. But, you know, if, if a white basketball player had gotten it, it would have been on the cover of Architectural Digest. And the, and the architect would have gotten the Pritzer Prize for it. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's just one thing. Yep. I mean, what I like so much about what you're doing is, is that it is important to preserve all of the architecture because you're uncovering stuff that just has not been on the radar and it's good work. That's wild. That's, yeah. that's the wildest thing. That's the wildest thing. Cause I'm, I'm such not an architect y'all. Like I'm, we're not I'm, architects either Coop. So there you go. I know. I know. <laughs> it's like, it's just like the wildest thing to like, you know, that the Noma exists, that the AIA exists and that none of them would have been doing or have been doing the work that I'm doing recently over the last two or three years. And it's not always the fun, it's the best feeling, right? That, that that's the case, right? Or it can be frustrating. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's frustrating. It's frustrating even being an outsider, insider kind of a thing where it's like, y'all see me doing this. And yes, I love that the Getty just brought that, the new, if y'all don't know about it, you know, $3 million grant, for with the National Trust for Black Modernist right. Architecture. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's great. I love that. And I feel like that was a reaction to some of the groundswell that this account has created. But it greeted me with a, a bit of a disappointment because still to this day, National Trust does not know how to communicate that this grant exists to the people that needs to connect with this grant. And it's yeah. a language thing. It's just language, or they could have actually just hit me up and say, hey, we want you to help us promote this grant. That's what a lot of like entities would have did if there was a, a entity like mine that was focused and that was doing a, a decent job. And National Trust, are you I listening just, here? Yeah, National Trust holler at me like, we need to be able to promote in the way that we know is effective, you know, to the people that we want to obtain. Just now, it's unfortunate that just now announcing it may keep it just in the silos that it was announced in. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. So how do you discover these projects, these houses? I mean, if you can't go to something like the National Trust, what do you do? Yeah, it's been really interesting because I got to shout out the Hood Century audience, you know, the community and the people who have been watching me through this journey because they have been the ones that have put brothers and sisters, uh, Amaza Lee Meredith, a lot of these people, they've, they've been the one that put them on the radar for me, okay? So it was actually a community thing. Shout out to Hannah Simpson over uh, in uh, in the Bay Area, Doko Moko. I mean, so many people have just like been in my DM saying, hey, did you know this? Because they see that I'm an amateur. So they see that I'm like attempting, but I may not know James Garrett, Max Bond Jr. These are all people that oh, were, big time, yeah. Um, yeah, people just basically like DM'd me and were like, hey, I see you like this. Do you like this? So that's like some of the ways. And then, yeah, like just like 2020 would have you. I was just Googling black architect in Denver. And then I would Google black architect in Sacramento. And I would just basically do these like Googles of like different neighborhoods and cities that I think may or have black architects at all. And I started to see myself finding a person or two that was starting to come out of the George Floyd kind of movement, right? Like a lot of firms and historians and would, would sort of like start to put things up around that time. So I do it like that. Yeah, man, I'm mostly just talking, right? Like I'm mostly just sharing with people the things and then people come back. Hey, have you heard of this person? you have a favorite discovery? I mean... Man, that's hard. I mean, the North Carolina <laughs> house was by the grave by um, Clinton Gravely. By the Gravely, that that blew that blew my mind. Him and his sister, you know, working on a house. Him going before to Howard University School of Architecture, right? Like 
to then go and build the you know want to build out the space i i was able to um to purchase some land in ohio and i kind of i'm starting to understand what land means so for him to purchase this plot of land and then work with his sister who then followed him his little sister followed him through and then they built this estate with horses and just like you know a place that felt like a you know like an oasis a, a that probably is one of my favorite recent discoveries and the intention of the way that they built it. He actually talked about building it for his wife, you know, and like building it as something that she could have because of his long hours and his dedication to, to architecture and design. When was this? Um, this was in the 70s. This was, oh, not that long yeah, ago. Yeah, this was in, in, in the, I think they started in the 68, 69, designing it, and like were able to build it by like 73. Oh. And then there is a house in West Adams, Los Angeles. It's uh, we've been calling it the Robinsons house. And there's a, it was a, fa- a young family, uh, a doctor, and a stay-at-home wife, almost like she was um, like a Martha Stewart. She was she was a young black woman who loved the culinary, and she must have loved design in the kitchen because she basically had a, a show with the LA Publications like in her kitchen that was designed by her and her husband. They actually tore down a craftsman in West Adams, which obviously you can't do anymore. Yeah. And then they built a modern home in, in around 51, 53, very early. And it's one of the few modernist residential homes in West Adams. I've, I've come to find out. But this is all custom built, custom built in furniture. Everything moves so amazingly. I, I almost liken this design to to the Japanese modern, right? Where you would have these natural trees that would greet you inside the house. You'd have this natural oh, wow. light cool. um, that would greet you as well. Uh, and then the new owners, man, shout out to Mark. Uh, one of the new owners of this space is wanted to restore it back to its glory of its intention of its owner. So that's in West Adams, the Robinson's house. Uh, and you can find that on my Instagram. It's really beautiful and really, really dope testament to, to real like Black modernism, you know? That's real great. I'm looking at this stuff on Clinton Gravely and his house. That's 7,000 square feet of house <laughs> Massive. and grounds. Massive. And wow. And just, just immaculate. And he's still there. He's going to be, I guess, uh, 90 soon in 2025. Wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't know that. So his daughter had hit me up in the DMs and I, we need to get up. But that's the other thing about like, the people being alive and the people still being there for us to engage with and right. uh, and celebrate while they're alive is just really, you know, it's one of the more important things to me, you know? So I got to link with him somehow. Right. Especially if it's an oral tradition, you got to get them while they're still oral. There you go. With all this going on, Coop, are you building some sort of infrastructure to digitize things? Yeah, so I mean, there's a couple of things that are, are happening, but one of them is I'm launching a website and it's going to be from Google Maps. So you don't have to go into like 20 steps or you don't even have to go to the website. You're going to click in our link in bio, wherever you see it, and it is going to bring you to a Google Map API, right? So mm-hmm. you're going to sit, you're going to be sitting on a Google Map. And you're going to be able to, we're going to be mapping, and I hope that we can put y'all stuff on there and get Docomo. I want to create a, an alliance of this stuff uh, around sure. black modernism and around spaces and neighborhoods. And so you're going to be able to upload video, audio, or text to a location, okay. using, utilizing all of the same tools of Google Maps. Um, and so then when you click on these things, you are able to save them. So if you go to, let's say y'all go into Asheville, North Carolina next week, and we've got three properties there, you can actually just go to your Google map and you would have had like, you know, Hood Century Asheville or whatever the person who saved this thing would have saved it as. And that's my next project is just create not only this mapping system from a tool that we use for direction, because my favorite thing, y'all, to say is black people don't know where we at. That's like my favorite thing. Like, yeah. we don't know where we at. You know? White people are uh, much better. Like, we don't know where you're at either. Right. So there you so, go. So yeah, so pe- a lot of people just don't know where the hell they're standing. And so I hope this map becomes that. And then what I'm doing is I'm going to be working with y'all and working with the new museum out of New York. So many people to help us create a sustainability for this map 
for a lifetime. So the first thing I'm going at is a 10 year support. And I'm going to go be going at 25 year support. And, and this is just so that we can ensure <laughs> that if you're looking for black modernists, if you're looking for black neighborhoods, or even just want to be able to share any race, color, and creed, archetypes or design or modernism that has been like not widely shared. Hopefully that this map could be that. And this map is not owned by me. It's owned by all of us. And and, and so that's like my biggest thing right now, um, as well as like hopefully being able to go to Modernism Week this, this year and really see what everybody else is up to and see how we can um, continue to come together for these causes of preserving uh, this great design and moment. Oh, that's so cool. And, you know, Coop, I think that you would want to just call up the National Trust yourself because it sounds like this is the kind of project they'd want to fund. So I have a small history with them where before this Black Modernist vibe, I would go to them talking about Black Modernism. They offered me a fellowship and wanted me to, like, really investigate Philip Johnson's, like, whole Nazi vibe. And I just was like, yo, no. Like, right. I'm tired. I'm fatigued from all of this George Floyd shit. I don't want to keep going into trauma. And I think, I really think that it prompted them to really investigate black modernism. So I don't think, and like, we're going to be on the record for this. I don't think I'm going to have a problem. We just are submitting our letter of intent for this current grant. Yeah. And I'm going after like storytelling and I want to like do some of the initial documentaries, like support a lot of the like black modernists and modernist general modernist documentaries with our language on them. And I don't think I'm going to have a problem with them, but I do agree that this should be well-funded or at least supported by, by them. And then you got to be the squeaky wheel. Yeah. Keep going back. They'll say yes. Exactly. I'm not mad at that. Coop, thanks so much for joining us. It's been really a pleasure and we can't wait to see what you're going to do next. Thank you so much for having me, man. Congratulations on everything I've been up to. It was really inspiring. Thanks for listening. U.S. Marnish Radio is underwritten by Diane Bald and the Budman family, restoring significant architecture in Toronto, Los Angeles, Malibu, and Palm Springs. Okay, Tom, close us out. Visit usmodernist.org's massive archives to listen to past shows, discover documentation of 15,000 significant modernist houses, and access 4 million pages of classic 20th century architecture magazines. U.S. Modernist Radio is produced by Soundtracks Recording Studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. Our theme song is performed by George Smart and Robinson Earl. Archivist Kelly Policelli handled guest research. U.S. Modernist Radio is a production of Modernist Archive Incorporated, a nonprofit educational archive for the documentation, preservation, and promotion of modernist residential design. I'm Tom Guild. George and I will be back soon with another yet-to-be-discovered but soon-to-be-appreciated edition of U.S. Modernist Radio.